Good morning. My name is Pat O'Toole from the Irish Farmers Journal News Desk. You're very welcome this morning to what's a pretty important event in Irish agriculture, um, reflecting a, an event which is deep significance for the entire continent of Europe. We're talking about Brexit. Um, Brexit undoes the union of 28 EU members. Uh, Britain will withdraw in the next two years. Um, Ireland is the country most closely aligned to Britain geographically and economically. Agriculture is the dominant sector uh, uh, in terms of our exports to the UK and is therefore the sector most affected. So for Irish farming, this is a profound event. Um, that's why IFA, the farmers organisation uh, for the family farmer in Ireland, has organised this event here today in Goff's Equestrian Centre. And uh, people are coming here from all over the country as we speak to hear the views of the likes of Commissioner Phil Hogan and Minister Michael Creed on the subject. I'm joined here by a panel of the IFA President Joe Healy, um, Sean Kelly MEP and Dairy Gold CEO Jim Wolfe to discuss what's in store today and, and some of the e key issues uh, around Brexit. Uh, Joe, why have IFA organised this event this morning? Well, I suppose, as you say, to get across those key issues and to highlight the absolute importance of maintaining the trade with the UK with the least possible disruption to that trade, but also maintaining the value of that market, in particular that uh, it won't be undermined in any way by foreign cheap imports, uh, as, as we have often spoken about, uh, and thirdly, to ensure that uh, in future we have a properly <laughs> funded, fully funded uh, cap. Jim, um, I suppose Dairy Gold, um, our second biggest dairy, uh, uh, the biggest co-op, um, hugely dependent on the British market, as is the entire Irish dairy sector in relation to cheddar in particular, but uh, an awful lot of north-south um, uh, traffic uh, for the dairy sector. Uh, what are the key issues for you in, in your position and, and the farmers you represent? Uh, in, in terms of Brexit? Well, I think, first of all, from a national position, it's, it's extremely um, serious what's, uh, you know, what's about to unfold because, in reality, the Irish dairy industry is almost an island nation. I mean, you know, the reality is that on the island of Ireland, there is almost 9 billion litres produced, 2.21 in the north and 6.7 down here. And there is a lot of intra-movement within companies between north and south, and there's inter movement between companies uh, both north and south uh, all along in terms of uh, Leinster, North Leinster and right into into Connacht and, and across Donegal. So there's a huge, you know, it's one, one island. So look, immediately when you talk about Brexit, you're talking about some demarcation uh, across between the six counties and the 26. Uh, and that has serious implications for everyone involved in that area because you have a fresh product moving north and south and some manufacturing the south for second preparation of the north for, for going abroad as well. So that's, that's the general concept. Then if we, if we drill down into the product portfolio and when we look at you know, the whole issue of our involvement as an industry, we've always been taught about diversification, we've always been taught about spreading out the risk. You know, the industry was built in the 60s on the basis of a skim and butter portfolio. Well, you know, many industries have evolved into a, a much broader portfolio now where, you know, cheese is a, a significant uh, part of it. You know, a, a live product that is consumed, uh, you know, in a variety of shapes and, and sizes across uh, from a discerning uh, customer base, Europe and beyond. And we have particularly, I suppose, focused on the British market over the last number of decades. Uh, we've invested very significantly in the south of Ireland in particular, uh, where four of the main processors actually uh, supply uh, approximately 110,000 tonnes of cheese to the British market, give or take a few, depending on the year, but, you know, 100 to 110,000 tonnes. That is the equivalent of the milk supply of dairy gold in its own. So that's the enormity of that market. Now, <coughs> You know, the challenges that we look at is, and what makes us very scared about the whole process and makes us really sit up and think is that Prime Minister May, in her utterances, as it were, uh, and her, her re real hard talk on the matter, said that uh, uh, no deal was better than a bad deal. Uh, no deal defaults to potentially WTO tariffs. Uh, and in that situation, WTO tariffs as they stand are 1,670 euro a tonne. Now, that is, in the context of uh, 10,000 litres to make a tonne, is roughly 16 centilitres, or a bit with it, of a tariff on a litre of milk going into cheddar. 
So that's the starkness and that's why I'm here and very supportive of the context of uh, this Brexit forum in the week that's in it leading into the, the council meeting on Saturday. And that 16 cent a litre represents half the current price effectively. A 50% uh, of, a 50 of to, tariff, to yes. the farmer. Yeah. Um, so because cheddar is a, a product that is the dominant Irish cheese that we produce, it's, uh, Britain is the main market for that in Europe, is the danger that we're going to end up as soft sellers of hard cheese? Uh, if, 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 we're, we're f if that tariff situation, that worst case scenario were to come to pass? Well, I think, you, look, you have to look at all scenarios and the last thing you'll be is a soft seller. Uh, you know, we have to maximise the return for our members as, as, as is our uh, raison d'etre as well. But if you just look at the context of trying to recover, first of all, the price, mm -hmm. uh, and a quick exercise at the moment, just uh, a 200, 200 gram pack of, of sliced premium Irish cheddar through one of the multiples at the moment, Tesco for example, is about 139, 139 for that. That's the equivalent of almost 7,000 euro a tonne in terms of retail price. Now to apply the tariff back on that is 24% of a price increase. Now that isn't sustainable. So that's, the, 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 at least not instantly. Uh, going into a market, it is prob or going to market is probably getting into a, a more, I suppose, a depressed state. Uh, where you'll have food inflation and so on and so forth. So they're the challenges. Uh, so it's not an easy exit. Uh, it is equally not easy to find an alternative market because if it was there, that's where we'd be today. You know, if there was more return or better return, we'd be in that, in that stream. So there's a long transition period needed and there's a long period of stability needed to move to the new era. Sean, Jim says a long transition period needed. Um, uh, John Bruton, um, who has vast experience in Brussels, mm. Dublin and uh, uh, internationally, has written in our pages that it inevitably it's such a complex legal uh, series of arrangements and, uh, and contracts that it will be a long transition period. But uh, in terms of the issues that Jim has raised there, he's broken it down to nuts and bolts, a potential of a tariff of 16 cent a litre on milk, which is that will erode the farmer's income, it makes it unviable. Uh, what can the politicians in Brussels do to uh, minimise the, uh, the trade barriers that will exist, specifically between Ireland and the UK, but broadly across Europe in, in a post-Brexit environment? Yeah, firstly I would say that uh, Jim is right, that there will be a transition period. And I think people should get the timelines uh, clear for the start. There will be a two-year negotiating period during which nothing will essentially will happen. Then there'll be the withdrawal agreement because they have to be out of the European Union prior to European elections in two years' time. And then there'll be a transition period. How long that will last is a matter of debate. Uh, John Bruton is right. If you were to get everything done, it could take uh, anything from five to ten years. But at the same time, I hear over in Brussels there's a determination to try and get the main body of it done within three or four years. But that actually gives us time. So you're basically talking about five years before anything of the nature that Jim is talking about would happen. But by outlining in stark terms the actual practicalities of a hard Brexit and tariffs, I think that will focus people's minds. Because while we would have a general picture and people accept it in Europe that Ireland will be impacted more than any other country, that we need to preserve uh, the free and open border we have at the moment and try and keep the trade with Britain as easy as it is at the minute. But the actual practicality of that is what's going to be actually coming on the table when the real negotiations start in two years' time. And I think while that's the doomsday scenario in one sense, we must say that is not what we want. It's not in our interest. It's not the British interest either. I mean, Jimmy is right. Theresa May did say that no deal is better than a bad deal. But actually what the British really need to think about is that no Brexit is better than a bad Brexit. And I think that's the way they would have to look at it. And that's the way Europe should look at it as well. Uh, Joe, um, Jim painted in fairly stark terms the, the stakes for the Irish dairy sector. But um, the report that the IFA uh, commissioned uh, um, and produced uh, on the implications of Brexit mm -hmm. showed that it's across every sector, isn't it? I mean, um, dairy is actually not, not even the worst affected. Our beef sector is poised to be decimated by a hard Brexit. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, and we took uh, figures from the ESRI and Chagask figures as well. And, you know, anything other than uh, an acceptable Brexit is devastating and would finish the livestock sector here. We, we like everyone knows, we export 90% of our beef. 50% of what we export goes to the UK, uh, worth 4 billion euros. I think the figure back from ESRI was that, you know, uh, if it goes wrong, 
it would mean a loss of two billion to the beef and dairy uh, exports uh, combined. So we've already seen uh, some people in the mushroom sector, uh, not you know as big as the beef sector, and not as spread out around the country, uh, but no less important either. And we've seen a number of casualties there. I remember last June when the vote took place, uh, speaking to uh, our mushroom chairman, and he said that at 81 pence. That was the line in the sand for them. It's a long time ago since we saw 81 pence in the context of last June. Um, you know, and we, so we've seen uh, a number of um, significant uh, mushroom growers uh, go to the wire over the last few months. But you know, right around the country, if you talk uh, to beef farmers, they're very concerned about it. We saw in the last six months of last year a, hundred, a conservative figure of 150 million euro wiped off out of the beef sector, total loss. When that's wiped out at beef level, it filters back down to the storeman, the Weenland uh, farmer, and indeed right across the rural economy. And 150 million is a lot of money spread, uh, spread around the economy. So uh, a number of areas there. Jim has, has rightly pointed to the significance of it in the, in the dairy sector, but all sectors. Uh, we also have the issue with sheep, and I suppose the big question there is the amount of New Zealand lamb coming into Europe and where, where's where is that, uh, that going yeah. to end up in future? So and the 700,000 lambs coming down from Northern Ireland and previously from Scotland to be slaughtered in our plants. There's a question over the, the viability uh, in terms of the scale of our, of our uh, sheep plants have, uh, without that, that lamb. You have the sheep coming one way and you have the, our pigs going the yeah. other way. Like it's, a, it's a hugely integrated system between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland and you know the, very much so in, in the dairy side of it as well. Um, so there are an awful lot of questions, an awful lot of potential problems and our clear message here today is the, to the Commissioner and to the Minister uh, and I've met, we, uh, in the IFA we've met a lot of European politicians and we met Michel Barnier two weeks ago to highlight to him the absolute need in order to safeguard the 44,000 jobs that's involved in agriculture, 44 million jobs across Europe in, in agriculture. Um, agriculture has to be at the top of the Brexit negotiations, the top of the Brexit agenda, because you know we, we talk about 44 million jobs, and some people might say, well, it affects Ireland more so, and it does. There's no country as badly affected as Ireland, and there's no sector anywhere in Europe that has the potential to be as badly affected as agriculture in Ireland. But if we're affected, for example, the displacement of product, and I'll, we'll use beef as an example, 270,000 tonnes of our beef goes to the UK. Obviously, if it's no longer going there and if WTO rules uh, and tariffs apply, we're obviously going to look to Europe for that. You put 270,000 tonnes of beef onto a market that's already fully uh, supplied. What sort of an effect is that going to have on the countries that's supplying beef into the European market as well? So there's questions there and there's concerns for farmers all over Europe. And I mean, today is about asking the questions. There's no easy answers here. But Sean, what's been painted here is a very compelling economic argument in favour of uh, sanity around Brexit. But that's the economics. The politics, of course, is another dimension. And we saw yesterday with uh, Marie Le Pen's success in the first runoff of the, uh, of the French presidential election, uh, uh, someone who's strongly um, uh, anti-EU, who's uh, uh, advocating the very same political process as Nigel Farage successfully railroaded uh, Britain out of Europe in, where they have a renegotiation of the treaty. If that doesn't go according to plan, then they have a referendum to the people. And uh, what are the political stakes here uh, for the, the institutions of the European Union? And is there a realisation of the urgency? Uh, is Brussels sleepwalking through this or do they realise that this is, this is you know, an end game if they don't convince the people of Europe that they're listening? Yeah, that's a very good point. I think you could say maybe they sleepwalked into Brexit, but Brexit was a wake-up call for them because I think everybody realised that this could be the case of death, especially if a f country the size of France were to leave, that would be more or less the end of it. So there has been a renewal of commitment to make themselves more relevant, both institutions and also to engage more with uh, citizens across the European Union. And I suppose to get their message across, because they really haven't got their message across of all the good work that has been done at European level. The critics had a field day. Just look at the, the media, the tabloid media in the United Kingdom. Day in, day out, 
they basically told lies about the European Union, but the European Union never defended itself. And they'll have to do that, but they will also have to become more relevant in terms of the legislation, more practical. And I think there is a sense that that needs to be done, because if it isn't done, uh, the momentum to leave will grow and grow, because there is an element of it now in every country. The only encouraging aspect is that post-Brexit, in the surveys that were done, uh, support for the European Union went up actually in a lot of countries rather than down because people saw what damage it could do. And I think that's something that we have to keep uh, our eye on as well so that uh, at the end of the day that sensible, uh, practical approaches are taken to all aspects and that will apply to ne negotiations on Brexit. There's no room for revenge or anything like that. We have to look at it from a practical, uh, industrial and economical point of view because at the end of the day, everybody has to try and live. The farmers of Europe must be able to have a product that will make a profit for them. The businesses must be able to do the same. And we have to try and preserve that in the context of the negotiations on Brexit. That's a sane approach. Uh, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. We'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you.